Welcome back. There are a lot of role play games out there. Terrors and Tactics is one role play game, and I'm here with a good friend of mine, Chris Johnson, the creator of Terrors and Tactics. Howdy. You, thank you for coming on our program today. Well, thanks for having me. Pleasure having you here, as always. And you and I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons for a long time. You've been playing a lot of other role play games too, but uh, yeah, it's just. It engages my um, inner frustrated novelist, you might say. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, I do all sorts of things with that. I'm also yeah. just artist in general. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of your artwork, and you use a lot of it in your Tarot's and Tactics game as well. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. And like I've said, we've we've been playing role play games for a long time now. But what made you decide to make your own game? Well, I'd always been big on house ruling on stuff, coming up with coming up with things that I thought better fit particular games, things like that. Um, the main thing that started out though was the transition from fourth edition D and D to fifth edition. Mm -hmm. I should start with the start with the fact that fourth edition is by far my favorite edition of E&D &D because it's the first time without house ruling I was ever able to explore some concepts that I always thought were just kind of basic fantasy tropes, but mm -hmm. you were never able to do them in D&D. &D. Like your lightly armored hero who just has his sword and his skill that mm -hmm. Before, D&D &D always had to bulk up on heavy armor or anything like that if mm -hmm. you were ever mm -hmm. going to be able to survive in a fight. Fight. Fourth edition was the first time with their scaling defenses that you could have a guy just in armor with a sword who's being a hero just like what you'd see on TV or in a movie or something like mm -hmm. that real easy. Um, second element of that was that um, you could go with the spellcaster, who is mm -hmm. able to cast their spells all day long. Third edition got into it a little bit with the I warlock, but it had mm -hmm. very specific character to it. Otherwise whereas, you were limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas with fourth edition, you were able to be a wizard, or you could be a cleric, or you could be what have you, and you could do magical things all the time, which is just like what you see in stories. It's not just oh, I only cast this one thing and then I'm done with it for the day, mm -hmm. what have you. Um, third one is um, I'm very Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm very Catholic, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends call me Captain Catholic. <laughs> but um, the whole pantheistic um, element of a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff with the gods and the things like that, I've never been 100% comfortable with it, but then they've always gated the healing and the stuff you need to really support a party behind mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. behind that, and that yeah. was always a thing. Whereas mm -hmm. in 4th edition, you had the warlord, and you had the, had the bard, and the artificer, and mm -hmm. these people who had nothing to do with the religious aspect who could fill that role in the party, and that just really um, spoke to me as mm -hmm. far as, because you don't often see, especially, and this goes back to stories again, you don't generally see some priest in full plate armor with a mace mending bones and things like that in the middle of a battlefield. Mm -hmm. It's not a big part yeah. of fiction outside mm -hmm. of D&D, &D, mm -hmm. whereas the notion of the charismatic war leader who says, get up off the ground and keep fighting, mm -hmm. you see that all the time in fiction. That's mm -hmm. something that you- In movies and books. And, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's something mm -hmm. something that is worth emulating. It, emulating. So in other words, fourth edition was the first edition where I really felt I could play what I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And then fifth edition came along and it, did a whole big thing with nostalgia. They started mm -hmm. going backwards on a number of things that I thought were really innovative. So initially, I was just going to make something that was going to be fourth, edi fourth edition Pathfinder style, if mm -hmm. you will. But 
One of the big things that struck me when I was reading about how fourth edition developed was questioning everything. That they, when they were developing it, they said, is this the best way to solve a problem mm -hmm. in role playing? And so I decided, let's go take a look at fourth edition. Let's not just copy it. Let's say, why did they make the decisions they did? Was this the best decision to make? And is there a better way to do it? And if so, mm -hmm. let's go with that. So that's kind of where it started, and that's why instead of being out in a couple of months, because I'm basically just taking the thing with a fi and filing the numbers off, so to mm -hmm. speak, I started actually looking at this, working on the mechanical balance and things like that. And I guess that's the other big thing that with terrors and tactics that mm -hmm. came out of this was not only was I trying to trying to bring in those elements that I felt were kind of cast aside with D&D, &D. another part of it was the interesting tactical combats. I think mm -hmm. that there's something to be said for being able to have have a fun get-together where, yeah, it's the battle might take 45 minutes, but everybody's having fun during it because they're getting to do interesting things. So yeah. mm -hmm. that's another aspect of it. It's why it ended up being called Terrors and Tactics because the tactics, I think, is a very important element of it, being able to make these decisions on the fly. Now, mm -hmm. I have options in the game where you can go super simple, where if all you want to do is say, I swing my sword at it every single turn, that's fine. If you want to go super complex, where you've got a different option that you're exploring every single turn, you can do that. Or you can find a balance in between. It's designed like that. Another part of part of what I liked about fourth edition was every single level you got to make an interesting choice about how your character developed. Mm -hmm. You gain a level, mm -hmm. you make a choice. And so that's something I also worked hard to incorporate into the thing mm -hmm. so that you are making choices as your character develops. Instead of having a list to choose from, you, yeah, well, you could choose, you could well, have guidelines even, well, of what lists to do. Are, or... Lists are important. They help you narrow things things down. But there were cases in D&D, &D particularly with some of them, where you'd gain a level and you'd get a couple of bonuses to things. Mm -hmm. You'd get some extra hit points and you're done. That's, That's it. it. Mm -hmm. That's Until all you get. Until a couple more levels. Uh, yeah. And so... Where's the fun in that? That that I think it's much more interesting to be able to, you gain a level and okay, I now have to make a choice. How does my character evolve? How does it change with time? Mm -hmm. And um, now that said, another thing going into this with fourth edition is, was I do think they kind of took some wrong turns with things. Um, I think their focus on narrative things it was kind of a good idea, but I think it was misguided in the sense that they were trying to turn gaming into telling a story. Mm -hmm. The thing is, mm -hmm. and this is something that stuck with me for years that somebody said, said was role playing is not storytelling. You are not telling a story when you're role playing. The stories come from talking about what you do when you're role playing. Mm -hmm. Remember that time when this happened. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. story. Having elements in the game that are more narrative focused, things like the once per encounter or things like that type of thing, those kind of almost get in the way of telling a story because they're making it overt that this is a story rather than these are characters in the world and mm -hmm. they might be doing something that's interesting enough to tell a story about later. Mm -hmm. And so as I was developing it, things changed from a much more narrative approach that fourth edition took into a very, into a much more simulationist kind of Essentially, the people get stuff based on real-world things. That was kind of another part of it is... Okay. Part of it is you get these things on uh, things. It's not just, oh, you finish an encounter, you get this back. It's, no, you wait a period of time, you take a rest, you refocus on things, things, and you regain 
an ability or you go to sleep for a period of time, mm -hmm. you regain abilities, that it was all very much based on based on more things that are things that would make sense for what a character could actually control mm -hmm. in the world instead of this narrative element saying it's okay to do this again. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a thing. Now also you said to me that uh, you had created some new races for the game. Could you briefly describe just a few of those? Oh, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things I started out doing was, this was back with the fourth ed part, was wanting to be able to duplicate every single race that was in fourth edition so mm -hmm. people could actually convert over from it. So they could play what they used to play in fourth edition inside Terrors and Tactics. But along the way, um, way it's like why not add some other things to it that mm -hmm. again going back to the typical fantasy type of thing i thing um you'll get stories where you have like your ordinary people getting involved in things sure but occasionally you'll get something really fantastic like a dragon or a giant or some sort of mutant abomination that actually is a part of the protagonists of the story mm -hmm. and why should those have to be NPCs so I started building okay. things into it um, one of the big ones is I call them avatars they're mm -hmm. essentially um, primal spirits if you will but they've got elemental themes but they take the form of anything from like just a person with elemental abilities to a talking lion to a dragon or a sprite any of these a sort centaur. of things that are kind of natural critters mm -hmm. critters in stories kind of nature themed things mm -hmm. you can play one of those from the start why does it have to be something that's kind of in the box kind of boxed over here in this is this is gm only material mm -hmm material that I wanted to have it be that. Mm -hmm. um, other examples are the Beast Men, where instead of having specific types, I have it as kind of a, and there's history to it, where they were kind of created mm -hmm. to begin with, but that by a previous empire, but that you build the specific type you want. You could be mm -hmm. a Minotaur, you could be a crocodile man you could be a raven man you could you name it you hmm. can use the building blocks of this to create something the same hmm. sort of approach goes for mutants and just any of the other things i tried to come up with unique hooks for each mm -hmm. of them kind of like the whole thing on all our dwarves are the same regardless of which the of which system you go into they all kind of have the scottish accent with mm -hmm. axes and are very gruff. Well, that's kind of boring. So I took it and ran with the notion that they got mutated from men, but it was a very sloppy job. So parts of them start to wear out as they age. And so mm -hmm. they kind of pick up kind of artifice, kind of like cyborgs, oh. if you will, as they age and get older, they replace more and more hmm. parts of themselves with kind of arcane machinery. Oh, well, that's interesting. So, okay. I mean, those but, are just a few examples. And you said this is in a place testing stage right now. Yes. Um, you'll keep in touch with us to let us know if you have any public events where we can do this and Working follow on. on your... I've got several groups actually mm -hmm. running tests right now. They, mm -hmm. I would not be anywhere near as good as I am with this without the play testers mm -hmm. feedback that they catch things that I mean I catch a lot just by rereading and rereading but some people just come up with really interesting combinations mm -hmm. that I hadn't yeah. even considered before mm -hmm. and they have found so many rules loopholes and things like mm -hmm. that that I've been oh. able to close and yeah. that's one of the things that I pride myself on is that this is a very mechanically sound game mm -hmm. system that I'm yeah. developing where as long as you follow just a couple of very simple guidelines mm -hmm. you'll have a hard time creating a character that can't be competitive mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I
pride myself on is that this is a very mechanically sound game mm -hmm. system that I'm yeah. developing where as long as you follow just a couple of very simple guidelines, mm -hmm. you'll have a hard time creating a character that can't be competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for joining us today. We'll go over character creation in another segment. You'll come back on for that. And I Sounds appreciate good. you joining us today. And Terrors and Tactics, it's coming soon. It's in playtesting stage. We'll be right back after this.